Okay, now let's talk about the psychrometric chart. Now this is an ASHRAE chart. I know it's hard to read. Everyone loves this. <laughs> uh, and we're just going to try to go through some basics very, very quickly. First of all, from an energy perspective, we're primarily interested in just three axes of this uh, incredibly complicated chart. And we'll start down here at the bottom. You see these circles here that I've circled in red? Along the x-axis of this chart are the dry bulb temperatures. Okay, that's uh, 60 degrees here, 65 degrees, 70 degrees, just like you would see on a temperature bulb outside your window. Now that's one important axis we're going to pay attention to. So for example, this would be 90 right here. Now another uh, axis that's important are these curves, okay, these relative humidity curves. I know you can just barely read this, but I'll zoom in on it in just a minute. This is an expression of how much moisture is in the air, and you can see this goes up uh, 10, 20, 30, and 40. So that's uh, valuable for us as well. Now the final axis we're really interested in is this one over here that's called the enthalpy. That's the total energy content of the air and the units here are 25, 30, 35, 40. All of these are in BTU per pound of dry air. Now if you're overseas out of the United States it would be kilojoules per kilogram. Let's do an example here. Let's say we had 90 degrees and I don't know 55 percent relative humidity so I would start down here 90 degrees if I was given conditions like that's the temperature outside and it's 55 degrees relative humidity I would be somewhere right about where this dot that I'm circling right now because you can see the 90 degrees you would go up and I said 55 percent relative humidity you can see this is 50 this is 60 Right, right about here would be about 55% relative humidity. Now, if I started off with air that was like that outside, um, let's just go through some basic concepts. If I were to continue to add moisture to the air, I would be going in this direction, you know, kind of passing through the 60% relative humidity line, and then the 70, and so on and so on. Okay, we're not going to do that unless we're trying to humidify, which is very rare. Now, another option is to heat the air. If I heat the air, I go this direction. So if I start at the circle, where I'm circling right now, and I heat the air, I go straight to the right. And if you imagine air expanding with water molecules in it, because the water molecule is entrained in the air, if we heat the air, the air is going to expand, and it's literally going to dry out, because the water molecules are constant. And you can see we're drying out the air, because we're passing through the 50% relative humidity line, we're going to pass through the 40, eventually we'll pass through the 30, and so on. Okay, So you can kind of see how if we heat the air, we're going to the right. Now, if we cool the air, guess which direction we're going to go? We're going to go this direction. And you can see as we cool the air, the air is getting closer and closer together. The water molecules are getting closer and closer together. And we're passing through humidity lines. We're getting more humid. We're going through 60, 70, 80, 90. When we hit this point, this curve here is called the saturation curve. Now, the saturation curve is telling you at, at this condition, if we take 90 degree air, and I probably didn't draw this exactly right, if we take 90 degree air, we would end up somewhere around 70, 72 uh, degrees is where you would see the dew point, okay? That's where the air cannot hold any more water, and literally it starts to rain. Okay, so that's kind of interesting. Now, another interesting thing, I mentioned that we would focus on the enthalpy, okay? So let's take a look at what the enthalpy of this original air was. The enthalpy, you go this direction, Okay, and this is going to tell you the total energy content of that air. In this case, it's about 40 BTUs per pound of dry air. And if we take that air, and in an air conditioning scenario, often what we would do is cool the air with a cooling coil. We hit the saturation curve, and we cannot continue to go through this direction. You just can't do it. So what happens when it starts to rain, we cool it down to the dew point, it starts to rain. We actually follow the saturation curve like this. And it would not be uncommon to cool, say, all the way to somewhere around, say, 50 degrees, okay? 50 degrees dry bulb temperature. Now, interestingly enough, the enthalpy in this condition is somewhere just above, you know, 20, say, I don't know, 20.5 or something. We could just say 20, just for a simple sake. And so, basically, we've taken air that has 40, to 40 BTU per pound, and we have cooled it to 20. That would be the cooling coil work that is being done. And basically, this will show up in an equation later, but for now, let's just say this is your delta H, okay? And we'll get back to that in a minute. 
So now that's very interesting. We've got our delta H from 40 to 20, and really that's the work that the cooling coil just did. The cooling coil took the air at the initial condition, we'll call that point A, and it cooled it to point B, which is the dew point, and then we kept cooling it all the way to point C. That would be pretty common air conditioning work. Now, what's interesting is most people, most humans, really want air that's around 70 degrees and maybe 50% relative humidity. So somewhere in this kind of box that I'm drawing right now is where people want to be. So it wouldn't be uncommon to go from point C and basically reheat the air back into what we might call the, the happy zone. And I'm sure some of you are laughing. Anyway, so trying to get it back so it's comfortable for human conditions would be somewhere in the box that's represented by area D. Okay, so like I mentioned, we want to get to this happy zone in D, and I redrew this here. Now let's erase the zone here just to show you the real deal here. So if we were to reheat this air back to say, I don't know, like I said, 70 degrees, we would come along this line to the point of 70, okay? And the enthalpy in this final condition would be, we would have to go on this line like this. And again, we're just kind of estimating where this would hit. And it's not perfect, but pretty close to 25. So just to review, we started off with point A with an enthalpy of 40, check. We cool the air to point B, okay, the dew point. We continue cooling to point C, and then we might reheat back to point D, okay? And in point D, the net energy or enthalpy of the air is 25, okay? So on a net basis, we're going from 40 to 25, but the cooling coil had to work as hard to get us all the way down to 20. So there's different delta H's depending on what you're trying to accomplish. The delta H for the cooling coil would definitely be 40 to 20, you know, this longer distance. And the enthalpy of the room air, you know, the net enthalpy change would be from 40 to 25. And that's how you would do that. Now, just to wrap this up, there is something called the wet bulb temperature, which is basically the saturation temperature. And the way that you would get that, instead of like before we, from point A, we would go straight left to get the dew point, the wet bulb temperature lines are more like this, okay? They're more angled. They're somewhat parallel to the enthalpy lines. And so you would come up to this point and we wouldn't go as far, but basically our wet bulb temperature would be somewhere around 76 for point A. And I'm just eyeballing that, just over 76. <clears throat> now that's wet bulb. Humidity ratio is on the right side. That's another thing you might be interested in for various purposes. And then volume. But just to review, the main things that we need to know is let's say we start off with air at a certain dry bulb, we come up to whatever humidity it is, okay, just pick a point, say 50% relative humidity, 85 degree dry bulb, and we would go diagonally to find out what the enthalpy is. In this case, it might be around 34, and that would be our H value, okay? So to wrap this up, all the time we're always going to the psych chart to get this value really what we're looking for is delta H. And in the US system, the equation that we would plug that into is Q equals 4.5 times CFM times delta H. And the units for this are gonna be BTU per hour. This is somewhat of a shortcut equation. In the System International, the Q equation is slightly different and it's also a slightly different psych chart, but all the mechanisms are the same. And the equation for this is very similar, it's just different constants. This LPS means liters per second. And the units for this are gonna be watts, okay? So in the US, we have CFM, cubic feet per minute, times 4.5 times the delta H. We get that from the psych chart, okay? And in the international, same thing. We get the delta H from the psych chart and we can plug it right into this equation for Q. Hopefully this helps you understand heat transfer and how the psych chart factors into that process. Catch you next time.